Simcha Torah literally means the joy of the Torah. And this is the time of year in Israel. They did it last Saturday, but uh, we have a Rev Shabbat, so we're doing it this evening. But the five books of Torah, the first five books of the Bible, are broken down into 52 weekly passages. And as we just ended it during Sukkot, tonight's readings, literally the Parsha was from Genesis 1. And it's interesting that our Torah scroll behind me here, we've had for 20 years now, 2003 is when we received it from Israel. And uh, it's 164 years old. It was walked out of Poland before the start of World War II. And the congregation that was in our early days, you're really not a synagogue without a Torah. And if you will, the, the congregation is married to it. We did a wedding service when we brought it in. It was very beautiful. And we've been talking about it, but we're always involved in a lot of aid and things overseas. And so a new Torah scroll costs sixty to $70,000. And I'm like, uh, no. I said, you know, if we could get one for like $2,500, we'd get one. Air freighted to the door of this building, that was exactly $2,500. <laughs> Next time I'll say $100. If this is your first Torah service this evening when we parade the Torah, if I enrolled this, which we wouldn't do, it's lamb skid and it's almost 100 yards long. And the lamb squares are about the size of this right here. And they're rendered and are dipped in a lime solution after they're tanned to stop them from shrieking. The scribe literally has like a 10 point and he puts the lines on it just like collegiate paper because we don't want the letters going up and down. They follow the line. Then the end of those are pierced and are sewn together with lamb sinew. So you've got the lamb, it's striped, it's pierced. Those two wood rollers it's hanging on are called etz kaim, which means trees of life. So you've got the lamb, the word, striped, pierced, hanging on the tree of life. In Exodus 19 and 20, what we were given at Mount Sinai was, was not only this, but a foreshadow of our groom, our Messiah, to come. So as you see people that are reaching their teeth and they're, they're kissing it, we're not idol worshiping. It's stated that at Mount Sinai, God reached out from the heavens and kissed the face of Israel. We're returning that kiss. So it's, it's true worship of the Lord. So tonight, at the end of service, we do something we do annually, and, and we're going to literally, the men are going to dance with the big one, the ladies are going to dance with the little one. But I got to admit, considering all this going on in Israel the last week, we come into Monday and Tuesday, I didn't want to do this. I looked at Rabitzin and I'm like, how? After the initial scramble of calling our friends and family and finding out, you know, who's harmed, who's not harmed, our thoughts have been consumed with what's happening in Israel right now. As I said Tuesday at Torah study, every time I see a photo of a young Israeli female hostage, I see my 17-year-old Jewish granddaughter. When I hear about those 40 dead babies in Kafar Aza, I see my three-month-old Jewish granddaughter. And last night I was destroyed. I, as my position, what I am, I serve on our national board of the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. The International Messianic Jewish Alliance had their annual meeting in Jerusalem, which started last Thursday. So half of our leadership team, our president, our general secretary, were in Jerusalem as this is starting. So that, that's another thing we were praying and interceding for and dealing with. But last night we were down at the Riverwalk in Yorktown, and the phone buzzed, and I picked it up, and several photos of those burnt babies. All I could do was weep last night, coupled with rage and anger. But my rage was stealing my joy. This Shabbat, I want to bring some heavenly strategies for our day today and the pending future. And I'm going to say this because this is, I've been preaching this for almost 10 years now. Never has it been more critical than right now to be stocked up and prepared. Our good friend Yuval Shached, 
I've been in communications with several times this week. He's, he lives in Jerusalem. And when the IDF told the citizens to prepare for three days or longer, there was a national panic. The grocery stores in Israel right now are empty. And Yuval is a kindred spirit with us. And they've been prepared for years. They were ready. Don't wait until it happens here and think you're going to get stocked up at the grocery store. Look what happens when a hurricane's coming. You should have 30-day supplies at least. I switch back and forth between warnings of what lies ahead, which is biblical. I have a kingdom responsibility and mandate to prepare your congregation and a movement by speaking truth regarding what's occurring now and what will occur as recorded in the scripture, which is here now. Coupled with heavenly divine strategies that will protect us and give us victories through the supernatural, as we see, and someone I want to speak a few minutes on before we perform Simchat Torah, King Jehoshaphat. He was the fourth king of the southern kingdom, or Judah, after Rehoboam. So this was after the kingdom was split, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Jehoshaphat's name means in Hebrew, Yah has judged, or Yah governs, which defined his reign as king. Adonai was with him. In 2 Chronicles 17, starting at verse 3, Adonai was with Jehoshaphat because he lived according to the first ways of his ancestor David, not seeking the Baalim, but seeking the God of his father and living by his mitzvah, not by what Israel did. Therefore, Adonai consolidated his rulership. All Yehuda brought presents to Jehoshaphat so that he had wealth and honor in abundance. In his heart, he highly regarded Adonai's ways. Moreover, he removed the high places and sacred poles from Yehuda. So he had a reputation. Second Chronicles 22, verse 9 says that Jehoshaphat sought Adonai with all of his heart. This gives us a profound example of the power found when expressed in worship, when expressed in obedience, living by Adonai's mitzvahs, living according to all his ways and acts of service that we do in love. As we've been sharing the last couple of months, you're born with a free will. You can do whatever you want to do. As a Jewish person, as a Messianic rabbi, we celebrate the feast days, but I do them because I love Adonai. So I don't have to do that, but I choose to do it. I choose to do what pleases and what honors him. And so in doing so, as Jehoshaphat, we see that his presence of the Most High God was with him. This then led to Jehoshaphat removing all the idols and the false gods. Jehoshaphat served, obeyed, worshiped, and lived according to the ways of Adonai as written in this Torah behind me, so that Adonai's presence was with him to delight in and meditate on Torah both day and night as an image of continuance and permanency required of all true biblical leaders. This established the metric, the principle, and the foundation of Jehoshaphat's successful reign as king. It required a kingdom foundation of meditation, of speaking, of pondering, and uttering the word Torah in order to allow the supernatural to invade the natural. This is the pattern for us as well. We must worship Adonai in obedience, service, spirit, and truth. Shaul, Paul, equated salvation in Yeshua in a parallel manner. In Romans 10, starting at verse 8, what then does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That is the word about trust, which we proclaim, namely, that if you acknowledge publicly with your mouth that Yeshua is Lord and trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be delivered. For with the heart one goes on trusting, and thus continues towards righteousness, while the mouth one keeps on making public acknowledgement and thus continues towards deliverance. See, this deliverance thing, it's ongoing. It's not just say the prayer and you're in the kingdom. It's not how it works. When one ponders, meditates, and proclaims, you literally speak or utter his word regarding Yeshua and trust in the heart that Yeshua is the Messiah, they are saved. Listen, when we ponder or meditate, when we speak his word regarding healing, Healing will manifest. When we meditate, ponder, and speak about the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Ruach, the Holy Spirit manifests. When we delight in Adonai's Torah and meditate on it, ponder it, speak it, and utter it all day and night, the supernatural is released. His presence appears. And when his presence appears, something will happen. This is parallel to what happened with Judah and King Jehoshaphat. In 2 Chronicles 20, starting in verse 1, sometime later the people of Moab and the people of Ammon with other ammonium 
came up to fight Jehoshaphat. See, there's nothing new under the sun. The names are different, but the spirits are the same. Jehoshaphat was told a huge army from beyond the Dead Sea from Aram is on its way to fight you. Right now, they are in Hatzazan Tamar, that is Ein Gedi. That's where David hid from King Saul. Jehoshaphat was frightened, so he determined to seek Adonai. He proclaimed a fast throughout all of Yehuda. And Yehuda assembled to seek help from Adonai. They came from all the cities of Yehuda to seek Adonai. See, Jehoshaphat reveals great transparency and humility here. When he's told the bad report, like all humans, he becomes frightened. There are thousands of stories regarding the fear Israeli families felt as Hamas was going through their villages, murdering, raping, and terrorizing the people. It's not that any one of us is immune to fear or anxiety. It's what we do with it, how we handle it that matters. The word states in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity. Dilea in the Greek, which means fear, timidity, or cowardice. But he's given us one of power, love, and self-discipline. Fear in Hebrew is pachad, whose root words, vapach or pachat, means to trap or snare, or it's a pitfall. So we're not to be possessed or seized by the spirit of fear. That's demonic. Way too many believers are possessed by a spirit of fear. And that is a trap, a snare, a pitfall of the enemy. Fear is an emotion that can polarize people, congregations, even nations. Fear can be seer enough to manifest into the physical realm and cause people to pass out. Or in some cases, it has actually caused heart attacks and death. You can literally be scared to death. But King Jehoshaphat was able to overcome the fear and seek Adonai. And by seeking him first, Adonai responded to the king. The king himself stands before a large assembly of men, women, and children from across Judah that have gathered together to fast, to pray, to seek, and worship the Lord regarding their imminent threat. The king himself prays out loud before the people to Adonai. 2 Chronicles 20, starting at verse 10. Now see the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. Verse 11, are now repaying us evil. They have come to throw us out of your possession, which you gave us as an inheritance. In fact, that's Hamas. Hamas is ISIS. And let me explain something if you don't know. Hamas doesn't seek to govern and become the new government of Israel or the Gaza or anywhere else. Hamas has one edict only, and that's to destroy every Jewish person alive. That's their goal. They seek to establish a caliphate from Egypt to the Jordan River. Same evil we're reading about here, right here. Verse 12, our God, won't you execute judgment against them? Yes. For we haven't strength enough to defeat this huge horde coming against us, and we don't know what to do, but our eyes, it says, are on you. In a somber moment of divine truth, submission, and humility, Jehoshaphat confesses and proclaims that Adonai is God alone in heaven and rules all the kingdoms of the earth. Nothing can stand against the power and the strength of Adonai. He proclaims Adonai's divine protection over them, as Judah itself does not have the strength or the ability to defeat the horde they face. Not knowing what to do, they stand before the Lord with their eyes upon him to pray, to meditate, to ponder, to seek him, which is what they should have been doing, which is what we should be doing right now. But another plug-in for tomorrow, 7 o'clock. In the middle of this, Yaxiel is given a prophetic word. In 2 Chronicles 20, starting at verse 16, tomorrow, he said, go down against them. They will be coming up by the ascent of Zit, and you will find them at the end of the Vadi before the Ural desert. You won't even need to fight this battle. Just take your positions, Yehuda and Yerushalayim. Stand still and watch how Adonai will deliver you. Don't be afraid or distressed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for Adonai is with you. Verse 18, Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground with all Yehuda and the inhabitants of Yerushalayim fell down before Adonai, worshiping Adonai. And the Leviim, the Levites, from the descendants of the Kati and the descendants of the Korchi, stood up and praised Adonai, the God of Israel, at the top of their voices. Praise, see, I can't necessarily carry two in a bucket. Oh, but it's loud. I love this passage. Only when all the people are gathered together in unity, catch this, in unity, meditating upon, pondering, uttering, speaking God's word in prayer while fasting together in one accord, 
They're seeking, the, they're seeking God. They're in the word, and he shows up. And when he shows up, something will happen. A divine word of knowledge is released. See the pattern here. Words can't accurately describe or explain that power is released when God's people come together as one from top to bottom, meditating, pondering, pondering uttering his word, crying out to him. This is what we must do regarding Israel in our current crisis. Like today, back then, Judah's in serious trouble, serious danger. They're facing an overwhelming force that's extremely close to and postured to annihilate and destroy them. And what are the results of serving, seeking, and worshiping Adonai, of, of living according to his way, of meditating and pondering and uttering his word, of prayer, intercession, and prophetic, Davidic, spontaneous, divine worship by Israel when they're facing almost certain demise and, uh, and annihilation? Well, in 2 Chronicles 20, starting at verse 20, the next morning they arose early and went out to the Tekoa Desert. Now, this is just between Jerusalem and Hebron. For those who uh, have traveled to Israel with us, we've been there. As they left, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Yehuda, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Trust in Adonai your God, and you will be safe. Trust in his prophets, and you will succeed. And after consulting with the people, he appointed those who would sing. Not those who could. You know, I look around during worship sometimes. Just saying. You don't have to be a professional singer. Just worship. He appointed those who would sing to Adonai and praise the splendor of his holiness as they went out ahead of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his grace continues forever. The king chose those who hungered after Adonai, those who, not who could, but those who would sing. And they were chosen to sing to Adonai and to praise the splendor of his holiness. He picked those who were sold out to God, not those who were professional singers. This isn't a gig. Those who were degreed or those who had the proper credentials or the religious certifications. But those who would. In verse 22 of 2 Chronicles 20, Then during the time when they were singing and praising, Adonai brought a surprise attack against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come to fight Yehuda, and they were defeated. I would be so bold as to say that I bet the worshipers didn't even know what Adonai was doing. They were just praised and the victory was theirs. And as they were singing and praising, he, the Lord, brought a surprise attack. This is supernatural. Their situation, their dire circumstances change in the blink of an eye from certain death and destruction of taking three days to collect the riches and spoil. This is a mystery revealed this Simchat Torah, this Shabbat. By meditating, pondering, praying, seeking, serving Adonai day and night as a unified body coupled with spontaneous prophetic Davidic worship, it's our nuclear option that opens the gates of the supernatural. This is what we need to get those hostages rescued, safe and sound, to give the IDF a complete resounding victory over Hamas and Hezbollah. Adonai will give Israel the victory of our enemies as we worship and dance with that Torah this evening. That's the revelation this week, which is why we're doing this. Their worship in 2 Chronicles 20 was deeper than the average daily prayer and petition that most give to Adonai every day. It's the deep, not the shallow, but the deep waters, the deep intercessions, the deeper understandings of God that he is calling us to. These worshipers praising Adonai had been plying the deeper waters of worship decades before the victory over their enemies. Read what the descendants of Korach wrote back at the time of King David. Psalms 42, verses 7 and 8. Deep is calling to deep at the thunder of your waterfalls. At your surging rapids and waves are sweeping over me. By day Adonai commands his grace and at night his song is with me as a prayer to the God of my life. See, they, they didn't just wake up and here it is. This is a disciplined life before the Lord. Amen. This picture of deep, calling God to deep, is profound. Not just for what it represents in prophetic worship and the inherent divine power, it also reveals their discipline, their commitment to God that was in place decades before this event. They had preparing their whole life to worship before the armies of God, the God of Israel to slay the enemy and rejoice in victory. Remember the words of Adonai to Zerubbabel. 
In Zechariah 4, verse 6. Then he answered me, this is the word of Adonai to Zerubbabel. Not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, says Adonai, save an oak. This week in my anger and rage and pain, I was ready to pick up my divorce and head to Israel. But that's not what he wants me to do. Jehoshaphat appointed the worshipers, the singers, to go out and meet the enemy, not the soldiers, not the most skilled archers. He sent the worship team out front. And they would not fight with the weapons of the world, but with the divine, supernatural, heavenly weapons of praise. The result? We've already read it. Adonai caused the armies of Judah's enemies to start fighting among themselves. When that army of Judah arrived, not a single one of the enemy was left alive, not one. What an amazing story. And this is exactly what we're going to do right now. His word will do what he sent it out to do. God's word does not come back null or void. He resides in the praises of his people. Adonai has appointed us, the worshipers, to go before the enemy to sing and praise and to dance before him to gain the victory. Wes, if you'd come up, take the plate, the breastplate off the Torah. If we could have the babies brought in from the nursery as well. No, I'm sorry, parents, you have to go get them. We want to do this as a family. We're going to line the men up over here in a circle. Those who want to do it, I'm not encroaching on your free will. Ladies, we're going to ask you to come over here. Jamie and Audrey, if you would stand up. We're going to ask the children to go with them, for they have even little tours for them as well. So children, meet Jamie and Audrey in the back. Ladies, come over here with Barb Rabitzen. We have a special tour just for you. And gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to remind you once again that this is a 164-year-old tour scroll. It's not a demonstration of your, of your dancing prowess this evening. We want to keep it safe. Grab it, dance for 15 or 20 seconds, then pass it off to the next person who wishes to do so. But all who want to participate, you're welcome to come and join with us. And gentlemen, the big one, put your arm around it and hold both spindles on the bottom. Amen? Amen. Well, Father, in Yeshua's name, we dedicate this time to you now as we meditate and worship and ponder your word that we shall see the enemies of Israel flee before you. We do this tonight in spirit and in truth. We do this in obedience and submission to your word. And we thank you, Abba Father, for your Torah, which goes forth from Zion. Your word will do what you have sent it to do. We honor you and worship you this evening. This Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.